She's been recognized as one of the greatest leaders in the world. This country is so divided, but it's so also not divided. We push people to the opposing sides rather than try to find a common ground. I think that that radically has to change. Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Phil, and you are back on Phil in the Blanks again. My guest today is somebody I think you are going to really be fascinated by, a once-in-a-generation talent, somebody that is changing the world in ways that will benefit us all for decades to come, generations to come, because she's making changes that really have to do with redefining how people see themselves, particularly women. I'm talking about Reshma Shajani. She is building a pipeline of young women to work in computing and reshaping the global economy with her powerful, innovative, game-changing nonprofit, Girls Who Code. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute. If you think this doesn't apply to you, it does. You may think, oh, I'm not going to be in computers or coding, but it's about so much more than that. She is the first Indian American woman to run for Congress, worked with the House and Senate to develop a, quote, Marshall Plan for Moms in response to the crisis mothers have endured because of COVID. She served as New York City's deputy public advocate to support Dreamers and to help revise the nation's campaign finance laws. She serves on the board of overseers for Harvard University and the International Rescue Committee and serves on the board of trustees of the Economic Club of New York. That's just among her growing list of important responsibilities. She's also a wife and a mother in her spare time like she's got any. She's been recognized by Forbes as one of the greatest leaders in the world. So we're just talking about somebody that is a mover and a shaker. I said it was not just tech. We're talking about a gender gap and supporting moms in the workplace and identifying ways to really reach economic empowerment, psychological empowerment for women. And this is really based on empirical evidence. Reshma, thank you so much for being here. I I can't even begin to tell you how interesting that is to me and how many questions I've got for you. Thank you, Dr. Phil, for having me. I've been a a huge fan of yours, so it's wonderful to be here. Well, I'm interested in talking about how you've conceptualized women in today's world. You also have a new book, Pay Up, The Future of Women and Work and Why It's Different Than You Think. And I want to talk about that. But I want to talk about you first. How did you get really interested in, and I'm not talking about the coding aspect and all of that, but the role of women, you talked a lot about how boys are raised one way and girls are raised another, and it's reflected in actual research studies about how boys and girls as early as the fifth grade, react to challenges in a different way. What got you interested in all of this? Well, you know, I'm the daughter of refugees. Uh, My parents came to this country in 1973. They were expelled by the dictator Idi Amin. Uh, There were two of a thousand refugees that got status to come to this country because they were engineers. My father, though, had to work as a machinist in a plant. You know, my mother sold cosmetics. And my dad, when, he, when I was very little, he would read me these little Reader's Digest books about Dr. King and Mahatma Gandhi. And there was something about hearing those stories when I was little about these change makers, these, these warriors, you know, these people who were put on the earth to, to do something that stuck with me. And so I've always wanted to fight for people like my parents, vulnerable, poor, you know, people who, you know, others had counted out. And, and as we know, Dr. Phil, a lot of those are in our society and across the world are women and girls. And so there was something, I don't know, I, there, I've always been moved by the plight of women and girls. It's always been my, my, the thing, the people that I've wanted to fight for. Do you think that's changing in America at least? Or do you think there's still that big gender difference? 
in the way they're treated and the way they see themselves. I thought it was changing, you know, and then the pandemic hit and, I, and, and women are in crisis. You know, Dr. Phil, the, the you know, the CDC reported that the, the second subgroup besides young people that the, have the highest levels of anxiety and depression are moms. Moms don't break. But there's something about the past two years in the pandemic. There's something about our public policies. There's something about our structure that we have in our society that is really pushing mothers to the limit. And, you know, one of the things I've really been reflecting on, you know, is the fact that, like, we, we just think that in, in our country or in, in America in some, in some ways that, like, motherhood, parenthood is a personal choice. And so you don't get anything from your government, your society, your neighbor, your friends, your workplace. Right. But like you don't have a functioning society, you know, that has a declining birth rate. You know, family values, being at family is like such a core part of what it means to be an American. And I think we've lost a little bit of that. I think but I'm way older than you. And so I've grown up through some different generations. And in the 50s, we were not a double income society to the degree we are now. I think now the statistics are high 70s, maybe yep. even low 80s double income society, whereas in the 50s, it was maybe half that. So now we've got both parents working outside the home, bringing in income that the family relies on. And previously, families adjusted to living on one income, and the second income was what you fell back on if something happened. Right. Somebody got sick or a job was lost or unexpected things came up. Then that second partner would get a job and bridge the gap. But now we're a largely double income society and 100% of those two incomes are being absorbed. So there's no cushion right. there. But women are a vital part of the family's economic lifeline. That's really showing the pay gap, right? Because they're yeah. out there in the workplace, but working for less. That's right. That's right. You know, women are not a must, a, a nice to have in the workforce. They're a must have. But the problem is, Dr. Phil, we built workplaces on the fact that we've treated women as a nice to have. So, you know, we have work days that are nine to five and school days that are eight to three. Because back in, like you said, in the 50s, he was at work and she was at home and she could pick up the kids. Now it doesn't work that way. And so all of society is, is based on an outdated model that no longer exists. And who's picking up the slack? Women. And the pandemic really exposed this. So like when schools shut down, a lot of families in America treat schools, I know my parents said, as daycare centers. Of course. And so when schools shut down and you still had to work, you had no no system of care. And, you know, when we created this thing where you had to like log in your kid at Zoom, you know, I have a kindergartner. I can't be like, hey, Sean, log yourself on. See you later. No, I got to be right there with him while I'm trying to keep my job. And so when that happened, it was women that were doing that unpaid labor, that homeschooling, the cooking, the cleaning, the putting on your mask, making sure you wiped off everything, right? Just in case the virus, I mean, all, all of that while you were maintaining your full-time job. And, and, and nobody was looking at this saying, whoa, 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 we got to rethink this. I can't cite the study, so I'll talk about this anecdotally, but there are studies out there to this, and if people can find them and send them to me, I'll appreciate it. But I recall a study from many years ago that looked at the number of steps, the number of activities that stay-at-home moms did compared to mothers working outside the home. And it wasn't totally isomorphic, but very close to the number of steps, the number of movements and activities that stay-at-home moms did compared to mothers working outside the home. And so these people that think, well, stay-at-home moms, they just kind of sit around on the couch and eat bonbons all day. Not true. Nope. What it amounts to is a working mom goes and does what she does. Then when she gets through with that, she has another full-time job that she does on top of the job that she leaves the home and does. So it's like two full-time jobs. Yep. When you said that the pandemic has shown them to be the second group that has been impacted by increases in anxiety, depression, stress, mm -hmm. 
loneliness, even some learned helplessness creeping in there. That's absolutely borne out by the statistics. And I think it is because of this feeling of I'm now overwhelmed. I, I've got the financial pressure, jobs are lost, my children are showing emotional problems, regression, depression, anxiety. Here I'm trying to keep all of this together and can't do it. And so many of these women can't do their job working at home because it's a service job, just like a lot of men that drive a truck or they're working with their hands or whatever. They can't do it from home. They have to be on site to do it. So that creates tremendous anxiety. That's right. And I think the thing that we told ourselves before, at least I certainly did, is he just doesn't know. You know, I'm, I married one of the good ones. You know, I made sure that I married someone who did the cooking, the cleaning, all that <laughs> stuff, right? Like, but then when we had a kid, when we had my first son, Sean, I took my maternity leave and he didn't. And then suddenly I knew where all the stuff was, right? I right. had, and so my to-do list went like this and his shrunk. And it is the constant thing that we argue about, right? One third of divorces are, beca- are about the chores. But part of it, it was, I think for a lot of us, we told ourselves, well, our partners just don't know. They just don't know all the things that we do. And then we got locked in the house with them. And they knew, they saw us doing our laundry in between our Zoom meetings. They saw everything that we were doing and how much we were doing. The whole world did. Our president did. Yes. But no one said, oof, not just thank you. Thank you for saving our country. But also like, this isn't fair. This isn't right. We got to rethink this. And, you know, the reality is, is that, you know, if we know that we need women's labor for the economy and that in order to do that and that women are doing two thirds of caregiving work, they're doing two and a half jobs before they do their full time job. We need to be thinking about what are the structures that we can put into place, you know, that can actually support working women and working families, you know, with this domestic work. Um, so I think, it, you know, you always think about like, what are the silver linings of crises? And like, this is the silver lining of it, because the reality is like nobody wants to have kids. Young women look at me and they're like, no, thank you. And it, as you know, a society that has a declining birth rate is a dying society. Is that the reason you think? Do you think that's the reason there's a decline? How do you assess that? I think it's all about the cost. I mean, think about it. Like, you know, I think about my parents, they were refugees. My mother couldn't afford the $50 a week for child care. And so from the time that I was 10, I was a latchkey kid. My sister would pick me up at middle school. We would run home, lock the door, right? Because back then it's like we were terrified someone's going to kidnap us. Right, I, think about, I think about my mother and how she felt sitting at her work at 2.45, thinking about her babies running home by themselves. But the point is, is that so many families have always had to make these unconscionable choices. You know, a story I talk about in my book, Pay Up, about a mom who had to go to work at a pizza parlor. She didn't have childcare. So she left her kids at home and she got put in jail for child endangerment. So, you know, we don't give families slack and the cost of childcare has just skyrocketed. You know, in New York City, it used to be $15 for a babysitter. Now it's 25. So, wow. you know, it's the largest cost center of, you know, so many families. And so it is also like an economic issue. You know, we, you basically work to work and not work to live. And we got to restructure society so that we work to live and not work to work. That's an interesting way to put it. You work to work. And of course, those women that work in, men that work in daycare centers, they deserve to have a great wage as well because we're turning over to them our greatest assets. I mean, that's what I say about teachers. I can't even hardly look teachers in the eye. Mm. I mean, we're turning over our children to these people for 40% of their waking hours and we pay them such ridiculous wages. I don't know a teacher that doesn't get in their own pocket to get materials for the classroom, whether it's construction paper or colors or markers. Teachers don't do it for the money. Right. Let's put it that way. They're getting in their own pocket to facilitate right. their classrooms. So we clearly have to pay these daycare centers a good wage if we want quality people there. It's tough all the way around. We also have to focus on what we're teaching these kids when they're in school or when they're in daycare. And that's what I was saying. You say there's this gender difference, not just about the job they're doing. It's about the values they're being taught. You made a big distinction about the difference of 
young women and girls being taught to strive for perfection mm. and young boys being taught bravery. Mm. That was a big difference yeah. to you. Talk about that a little bit, because I really want people to hear your take on that. It's yeah. very interesting. So, you know, a couple of years ago, I get asked to do a TED Talk. And like I said, you know, I've been working on fighting for women and girls my whole life, led my first march when I was 13. And so I wanted to take that opportunity to get on that stage and, and say something about gender equality that like may put the conversation in a different perspective. And I run an organization, Girls Who Code. You know, we have taught half a million girls to code across the country. I got Girls Who Code clubs in every county, town, and parish, you know, from like Kansas to Nebraska to Atlanta, I mean, everywhere. And, you know, when girls come to our programs to learn how to code, none of them have coded before. And so you're coming in with no knowledge. And during that first week, every teacher would tell me the same story. She'd say a student would come in her class and she'd look at her teacher. And she'd say, I don't know what code to write. And the teacher would look at her computer screen and she'd see a blank, a blank text editor. So if she didn't know any different, she thought that her student spent the past 10 minutes just staring at the screen. But when the teacher pressed undo a few times, she saw that her student actually wrote code, but then deleted it. So instead of showing the progress that she made or saying, hey, I, I wrote this, but I think I made a mistake, she rather show nothing at all. So it's this idea of perfection or bust. I tell this story on the TED stage. I walk up and I am inundated. You know, six million people watch this talk. And, they, and I'm with, with women who say, I do this too. With dads who say, my daughter does this too. With girls who say, and it didn't matter whether you were a teacher or a doctor, a dancer, or an artist, black, white, straight, gay, somewhere along the line, you had learned how to delete the code of your life. And what I mean by that is somewhere along the line, you had learned how to give up before you even try. And I wanted to understand, is that true? And if it is, when did you learn it? And can you unlearn it? And so, you know, I wrote my, my last book, Brave Not Perfect, about this. And, and I learned it is true. You know, go to any, you know, go to any playground in America and you'll see what I'm talking about. You know, we tell our boys to like climb to the top of the monkey bars and then just jump head first. But with our girls, it's like, be careful, honey. Don't swing too high. Did you take that toy away from her? Give it back. And what happens when, when girls are born, we want to wrap them up with bubble wrap. You know, a friend of mine just had a baby and she's teaching her how to walk and she's like walking behind her and she's like, be careful, honey, be careful, honey. And she's like, and then your voice came and I, I changed it to like, go baby, go baby. Right. But it's like this instinct that we have to physically protect our girls. And then around eight or nine, that physical protection extends to emotional protection. So when our daughter comes home from gymnastics and is crying because she can't do a cartwheel, we say, don't worry, honey. I'm going to put you into soccer. And so what happens is that young women get addicted to perfection and they gravitate toward the, the things that they're good at. And in that addiction to perfection, that not building resiliency, that not learning how to fail has huge consequences on every aspect. So, you know, in education, women didn't get a, a B, you know, declare economics as a major and get a B in their introductory level course they drop out, you know, whereas boys are like, I got a D I'm running for president, right? Completely yeah. different, completely different result. You know, you see the mental health, as you know, Dr. Phil, right? The rates of suicide, anxiety, and depression, much higher for girls, you know, than they are for boys. And you see it in leadership where men apply for a job if they meet 60% of the qualifications and women don't even apply unless they meet a hundred percent. So if we're waiting you know, if we're waiting to be perfect to lead, if we're waiting to be perfect to live, we're never going to close the leadership gap. And I think the antidote to perfectionism is bravery. I hear what you're saying. The flip side of that is boys growing. I grew up in athletics. I played football in grade school, junior high, high school, college. The message was big boys don't cry. I mean, rub some dirt on it, get back in there, be brave, be tough have some courage. That is the way we were socialized. And we were socialized really to suppress emotion. Right. So there are problems on each side as opposed to letting them find their own way. And what you're saying to these girls is don't hit undo, 
stay with it, work it out. It's okay. You don't have to be perfect before you present, right? 60% is pretty good. I was definitely taught fake it till you make it. You might think you're faking it till you make it, but the truth is you might have the most answers of anybody in the room at 60%. The leader with 60% may have a 20% lead on anybody else in the room and not know it. That's right. That's right. You know, I I have two boys. When I found out I was having a boy, I cried because, you know, it's so off brand, but, you know, God gives you exactly (laughs) what you deserve. But that's right. You know, my, my oldest son, Sean, you know, he's a little Gandhi. He's not jumping off any monkey bars. He's highly emotionally intelligent. He is the one who wants to cry. And everybody does tell him not to, that boys don't cry, or they laugh at him. And so my job as his mother is to make sure that he can just be who he is. But that's, that's exactly right. I mean, even if you, I mean, there are a lot of men who have perfectionist tendencies out there who also need to orientate themselves towards bravery. But, you know, the, the point is, is that we got to let people be who they are. And, you know, again, I think coming out of this pandemic, you know, we, we have an, an opportunity to really ask ourselves, who are we? And how do we stop putting people into gendered norms? How do we stop people putting people into boxes and then let them just be? A lot of people, I think, thought when this quarantine started, it was going to be short term. And when it stretched out and stretched out and stretched out, they thought, okay, when it's over, everybody's going to just have such a pent up appetite for getting back to their life, such a pent up appetite for getting back to their jobs, back to their social activities, that they're just going to go rushing back out to the world. And I think people have really been surprised that they have regressed socially, emotionally, competitively, and that they're finding some things they took for granted earlier in their lives are now a bit intimidating. So they're kind of sticking their toe in the water a little bit. It is a time to rethink. And I've heard a lot of people talk to me about the fact that spending time with themselves has created a bit of an existential crisis. They've had some time to think, what is this really all about? I was doing all this stuff before that when I quit doing it, it seemed kind of silly that I took it so seriously. Yeah, it's powerful. I mean, you see this with care work. And I write about this in my book, Pap. It's like, you know, people always say to me, Rush, what, what do men think about your book? And I'm like, no, 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 they're with me. You know, they want, they want to spend time with their kids too. You know, you're the first time your dads who like didn't do the two hour commute and took their son to school or had them watch, you know, soccer. They became a part of the family and they recognize that like, that's good for reducing my diabetes and my heart attack levels and all of the, it's healthy for me. And I feel alive. I feel present. So I do think that like we're going through this kind of existential crisis, like you said, in America, in terms of like ending this kind of hustle culture that we have. Drive, 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 work 80 hours a week. You know, don't put your head up. Don't have any joy. You know, Don't spend time with your family or, you know, read a book. And I think people are like, no, 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 I don't want to live that way. You know, I want to live differently. And it, it is really this resistance, you know, towards in some ways what is like inherent, we think is inherent in a capitalist society but that is at odds with living life. Um, and I, I do think, especially now, as this is like everything's opening up and you have to then set your own boundaries about how you want to interact and how you don't want to interact. That's like, that's a lot of permission to people and in giving them control back over, over their life is something that I think we should stop trying to fight. Yeah, my wife Robin tells me frequently, you know, there's no prize, right? What do you mean? There's no prize for the busiest person in the world. If you think there's a trophy at the end, there's not. Just calm down because it seems like I'm always having something to do. But I'm really blessed in that my vocation and avocation are one and the same. I really love what I do. So it's like I want to really sleep fast because I want to get back up and get to what I'm doing. And not everybody is that way, and I'm not that way every day, but most times I'm really anxious to get back to what I'm doing because I enjoy it. But here's my question, because you have to message this differently than it has been in the past to young women and girls, this difference between bravery and perfection, and I've never looked at it 
from a gender difference standpoint, but I've always told myself and everybody I work with that we strive for excellence, not perfection, Mm -hmm. because perfection is kind of an excuse to sit on the sidelines. Right. It's like, oh, this essay isn't perfect. This picture isn't perfect. This project isn't perfect. That just gives you an excuse to not get in the game. Whereas if you strive for excellence, you just put it out there and you see what you got. But I'm really wondering if what your take is on what we're doing in colleges and universities today with young people in terms of preparing them for the competition of the real world. Because I always looked at universities as a place where we went for an exchange of ideas. It's a place where we went to hear someone that thought differently than ourselves, Mm. where we went to have an honest intellectual exchange, debate, discourse. Now, a third of students think it's okay to yell down someone, the speaker that differs from your point of view. They demonstrate against having someone on campus that disagrees with them. They complain to administration if a professor or instructor has a different point of view and advances a course curriculum that requires them to resolve cognitive dissonance by taking the other side in an argument. We create safe spaces. We do those sort of things instead of causing them to deal with discord. I wonder what you think about that. You know, when I was in, uh, when I was at Harvard and I got my master's, um, the Taliban came to speak. And I think I'm so happy that I got to sit in that room and listen to what they had to say. Because I think the only way that you can fight and that you can be an activist and that you can shift is to understand what people who are diametrically opposed to what you believe say. You know, I've been, I wrote an op-ed the other day about abortion. You know, six out of 10 women who get an abortion are mothers. And there's been a lot of interesting comments on my feed. Now, I don't delete them. I read them, every single one. And so I think, as a again, and from from my perspective, I want to I want to give the opposing side room. I want to I want to have relationships. I want to break bread with people who don't believe what I want what I believe because that's the only way that we can really 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 push and reexamine you know our own argument and our own viewpoint. And the, and the reality is, especially in this this country's this country is so divided, but it's so also not divided. You know, because we push people to the opposing sides rather than try to find a common ground. And I think that that radically has to change. It's because the thing is, it's like, it's not actually building, like, it's, it's kind of like what I say about failure. Like, I'm obsessed with Serena Williams. And, you know, Serena Williams sits at the edge of her ability and a coach who's saying, do it again, do it again, do it again. The only way you can be great is if you do it again and do it again and do it again. Now, the only way I can be a great social servant, a warrior, a change maker, is if I really understand what is driving people to believe what they believe and how do I get them to come over here a little bit, right? Like, so if I spent all my time talking to women, if I spent all my time talking to girls, I would never know how to change the behavior of men. I spent most of my time talking to men. And audiences that may not, you know, and, and you know what, guess what? Now 50% of girls who code teachers are men. Half of my board are men. My first three funders to my Marshall plan for moms are men, right? Because the only way we're going to get to equality is with men as our allies and as our partners in crime. But that means that we ought to have a lot of conversations, a lot. Yeah. If people had that attitude, we would be having a lot of these conversations that aren't being had right now. I'm not saying that we should all just get together and have a group hug. There are legitimate differences, and people should embrace those differences. But you have to discuss them and find some way to recognize you're not going to get everything you want. You're not going to give everything they want. You've got to find a way 
to compromise and live with it. I'm not saying everybody should just say, oh, well, we'll just all get together and live in harmony. That will probably never happen that you have harmony on things like abortion or issues that have to do with literally life or death. There are going to be philosophical differences, religious differences, social differences, and you may never get to a point of agreement on that, but there's got to be some way to coexist, and you're yeah. never going to find that if you don't talk about it. Well, it's it's ironic, you know, we got to a place, you know, during the Trump years where almost it was a point of pride to uh, distance yourself from a family member or stop speaking to a family member who didn't have the same political viewpoint as you. And that's that's not pride. That's That's sad. And, and so, you know, we got to move around, move away from that as being a badge of the, you know, again, the integrity that we have to our convictions and our ideas. Um, because the reality is, is I think a point of, um, I think when you know you've really made difference is when you have moved someone's opinion. They may not move all the way, but they've said, oh, okay, I didn't, I didn't think about it that way. And and I think that that is like really, really, really critical. I do think on college campuses that like I, you know, I went to the Kennedy School of Government. I heard a lot of people who didn't believe what I believed. And honestly, so much of who I am today and what I've learned and what I've built is by listening to the opposing side. I, I just think it's the only way that you grow, that you learn. Does that begin with toughening up? You talk to women about being brave. You decided to run for Congress. Mm-hmm. Did you think you were going to win? Oh, gosh, yes. You never run unless you think you're going to win. I was so naive. I, you know, I ran in 2010 against an 18-year incumbent in a Democratic primary. Uh, I thought I'd shake every hand, meet every voter. I had no idea what I was doing, Dr. Phil. Like, I was this daughter of refugees. I didn't know how to build a campaign. I didn't know how to ask for money. I didn't know how to walk into a senior center and, and give a talk. I mean, my first interview was on Chris Matthews. I'd never gone on TV before. He was so mean to me. But it was... But it was the best 10 months of my life because I, it, there's nothing like living afraid in terms of really just like, like I am not, if, by going through that experience, I am not terrified of anything. You know, next week I got to give a convention speech at Yale in front of like, you know, 20,000 people. And I'm like, bring it, you know, like because of that congressional race, because every feel fearful thing that ever happened to me in many ways happened at 33. And so, but yes, when you run for office, you think you're going to win. And, you know, the thing is I ran again and I lost again. That's harder because, you know, your second race, you've kind of like, you know, you didn't make the same mistakes. You learned all the lessons. You run a more perfect campaign. And then you realize, oh, maybe this is about me. Like, maybe you just didn't want to elect me. But even that, you know, Dr. Phil, it's like a gift because, you know, when you think about some of the best athletes, LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, you know, what kept them driving, what kept them, you know, again, drilling 16, 17 hours a day was something happened to them early in their career. You know, whether, you know, they didn't make a shot or they didn't get picked on the first draft, something happened to them. And that put a chip, uh, you know, a chip on their shoulder. So I've had a chip on my shoulder. You know, you read my, you read my bio in the beginning, be like, wow, you've accomplished it. Because I had a chip on my shoulder from the time I was 33 and was like, all right, you're not going to pick me. I'm going to show you that I can make a difference. And every, every, every day since then, you know, I get up and do my 16 hour a day drills. You know what I mean? And, 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 and show that I am worthy of being a public servant, that I am worthy of being an American. I'm worthy of like fighting for people and that I can make a difference, even though you didn't think I could. Yeah. And if somebody had said, well, We'll just change you over to soccer. (laughs) You wouldn't be sitting here today is your point, right? You didn't change yourself over to soccer. You said, no, I'm going to keep doing this. I don't care if I can do a cartwheel or not. I'm going to keep doing this until I get it right. And you're right. Michael Jordan, I think it was middle school. They called it junior high back then. I think he was cut from one of his school basketball teams. He wasn't good. He didn't make the team. And so he went out by himself and said, oh, you're going to cut me? Okay, watch this. Right. Look what happened since then. You really do find resiliency from those things. But what's the message to parents of young girls 
how do they do that? How do they instill that in them? Stop protecting them. Stop protecting them. That's what a friend of mine was telling me a story about her, her father when she was eight. I think he was in the military. One day he just walked in and he just took her pillow. I was like, you don't need it anymore. Like, it's, it's like that kind of just tough. Like, we coddle our kids. We protect them. You know, if they forget to bring their homework at school, we, can't, you know, we don't know what it feels, let them feels like to, to make a mistake or to not get picked. Like, we're, we're like, I still have parents, you know, who call me for their daughters to write recommendation letters to them. I'm like, they're 18. They can email me. So it's just like, we got we to gotta stop that. I, I, you know, I, again, grew up with like immigrant parents that were working class. They didn't know what I was doing. I wasn't in sports. <laughs> I mean, they didn't know where I applied to college. They didn't read my recommendation letter. Nothing. And I turned out fine. So I just think this whole intensive parenting, this over coddling, this over, we, we're literally building zero resiliency in our children. And then we wonder why they're medicated. We wonder why, you know, they're not able to deal with strife. See, that's what I worry about with the generation in the universities right now, not just women, but these kids that are not being required to do some of the things that generations before them have done. They're not having to take the other position. They're not having to deal with adversity. If I have two applicants in front of me, and one of them has a college degree and the other does not, but they're matched in every way other than that, same intelligence, same work history, same whatever, matched the same way. I used to always say I would opt for the college graduate, even if it was an irrelevant degree to what I was looking for. Because I knew one thing about them I didn't know about the other. I knew they could set a long-term goal. They could stay focused on that goal across four or five years. I knew they could get along with people. I knew they could put up with professors they didn't like, and it was their job to get along with the professor, not the professor's job to get along with them. I knew they could get projects in on time. I knew they could do what it took to get through a degree. I don't know that about college graduates anymore. I really don't. It seems like the system is bending itself to them as much as them bending themselves to the demands of the system, at least not nearly as much as it seemed like it was a generation ago or two generations ago. And I think we're coddling them too much. Yeah, I, but I think it's shifted. Listen, I think where did that come from? You know, some of that did come from the fact of that technology. You know, we had so much misinformation and disinformation that we, we felt like we had to coddle and protect, infantilize our children and just people, you know, to not be able to kind of make their own decisions and come up with their own conclusions. And I think that, you know, when I meet young people today, they're actually very well researched, meaning like they really go out there and see every piece of it. So it's funny, like as they come up to that, you can't like just tell them things and they'll believe it. You know, they really do like ask questions and think about it. So in, in some ways, maybe we ha colleges haven't caught up to where kids are at. Um, and I think that we just, again, have to like infuse a culture where if you really want to be, to ch you know, make a difference on climate change, you got to actually sit in the room and listen to climate deniers because the only way you get stronger in your convictions and make the difference that you need to make is you when you hear the opposing point of view. And I think that is just a shift, right? That we have to continue to say, and make to people. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I've met with a lot of college students in the last year, and there are things about them that bother me. But <laughs> one of the things I've noticed is they are so smart. They're so smart. They are so damn smart. They have so much information at their fingertips, and they have the command of that information. If they will just get a transmission. If they'll just get into gear, they are so smart. Yeah. I just know if they will get that part of it solved, I feel good about the future of mankind because they've got so much information and they're so smart and so articulate. Boy, they can make an argument. But this is what I find. That's why I don't know if it's the kids saying, I don't want to hear from the Taliban. I think it's maybe the adults. 
Because I actually think because they actually believe, like you have the wisdom to, you know, go through the information, decide for their own what is true and what is not true. Again, if I think that they would want to hear all sides, all pieces, um, again, just to get stronger in your conviction or to learn. So I, I don't know. I think that that is something I think the pendulum is swinging on that. Um, I, I really, I, I really, really do. I do think that this generation is, is exceptionally bright. That's what has jumped out at me is how really bright they are. I want to save some time for a minute to talk about your new book. And by the way, Reshma did not ask me to even bring this book up. So she isn't here to promote a book. This is something that I wanted to talk about. And it's Pay Up, the Future of Women in Work. You talk about the big lie of corporate feminism. Describe what you call the big lie. Yeah. You know, listen, I found myself in the pandemic with two little kids, you know, I had a newborn baby, uh, a, a six-year-old. I was, you know, working on my girls who code my organization. And, you know, when the pandemic hit, everything fell apart. You know, I had to homeschool my, my, my kindergartner, you know, save my, you know, uh, take care of my newborn baby and then save my nonprofit from being shut down. And all of my leadership team were just working parents. And a lot of us were saying, well, just hold on a second. Because when the schools open, the schools open, everything will be fine. And when the schools didn't open and they came up with this thing of like hybrid learning, where we'd get to log on our kids all the while we maintain our full-time job, I about lost my mind. Because the thing was, is I, was I, I naively thought, well, aren't they going to ask us if we have the time? to do that, to work and to take care and to homeschool our kids. And could they have come up with a different decision like other countries did, right? And then, you know, you saw millions of women, you know, leave the workforce overnight like this. I mean, women who had been studying to be nurses, you know, and had to go to Uber driving, move in with their parents, you know what I mean? Because dreams just dying on the vine. Children, you know, not being able to find food, put, put food on the table. Again, as you said, you know, 50% of women are, are the breadwinners. Three out of 10 American families are run by single moms. I mean, this, this, this was big. And you said globally that there were $800 billion in wages lost yeah. from women dropping out of the workforce yeah. during this pandemic time. Yeah, because you're your mom and it's your kids or your job. You're picking your kids. And we were forced because of the policy decisions that we made in this country to, you know, have to, again, supplement our unpaid labor for paid labor. And there weren't a lot of options. I mean, also half the daycare centers were shut down. The schools were shut down. Maybe you were relying on your parents. Now they're elderly. You don't want them to get COVID. So like you were left without any choices. Women were left. Families were left without any choices. And, you know, that's what inspired me to write this book um, and to, you know, ignite my, my next movement, Marshall Plan for Moms. Because, listen, my, the most important title I have is Mother. It's the one I fought the hardest for. It's the one that I am the proudest about. And, you know, I believe that we got to live in a society that respects moms, that lifts them up, that praises them, and that we create, you know, social structures that make it possible for you to work and have a job. I mean, for you to have, be a mom and have a job. And we don't make it. We make it so hard. And, you know, we got to ask ourselves, why? How can we change that? So many women, you said unemployment rose to nearly 15% during this time, and it's the lowest participation since 1988. What I worry about, just selfishly for the country, is think about the talent that has dropped out of the workforce. What the hell? Think about all the brain power, the talent, the creativity, everything that has dropped out of the workforce. What do you do to replace that? Well, listen, uh, you know, a lot of women are in jobs like retail, you know, education, healthcare. You know, those, a lot of those jobs are going to be are automated because of the pandemic. And so I'd like to see, you know, a national retraining program that helps women, you know, get back in, into the labor force. You know, so we have got to like, we also got to like stop fighting this flexibility in remote work. I mean, if you're a shift worker and, you know, you show up at your job at Walmart and now you've put your kid in babysitter, you show up and your shift is canceled, you're out money. Like we got to give women predictability right over there. That to me, you can build an app that allows people to shift schedules with one another. So again, how are we making it possible for women to work 
and again, not work just to work, right? right. And so the, to me, a lot of these things, Phil, I talk about in my book are just are real fixes that are not that expensive, you know, that companies can make. And, and that I think will really change the lives of American families for the better. Well, but this is a corporate culture thing. This is something that yes, has to is. be, it has to be interwoven into the culture. It's not something that awareness helps. This is something that has to be a company commitment, a company policy that when a woman takes a job there, moves her career in that direction, she's got to know this is part of what I have. Yep. Well, you know, in the minute, the moment we're in right now is a great resignation. Four million people are all quitting every month and they're quitting not because they don't want to work. They just want to work for you. And, you know, and I think what people are looking for is a company that has family values. I think they're looking for companies that are going to help subsidizing with child care. You know, I just launched a national business child care coalition, you know, with a handful of companies that agree that what they're hearing from their employees is that people need help paying for their childcare and that they can't work unless they have help paying for their childcare. It's not a personal problem. It's a business problem. And so, you know, when you think about childcare in this country, you know, most people, they pay more for their childcare than they pay for their mortgage. It's the largest cost center for families. And so if you're my employer and you want me to work and then I need support with, and, and, and the companies pay for other things. They pay for museum memberships or IVF or, you know, other things. So childcare can be something that, we, again, it's a business issue. And I wonder if it is a great resignation or if it's the great relocation. You talk about all the people that have resigned, but look at the numbers of the people that have gone to work. I think those people are just moving jobs. Like you say, they're going somewhere that they feel. They're going somewhere. Yep. They feel they appreciated. Supported. Yeah. And, and it, that works with their lives. I, I just think that men, women, they don't want to commute two hours a day. You know, they don't want to work at a place where if their kid is sick, they're going to get fired if they say, I need to, I need an hour, you know? So it, it is really about, we have gotten more connected also, I think with each other and with our families and what's important to us. And, you know, I think that drive, 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 like you said, that drive, 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 we've asked ourselves, well, what's the point of all this? So I think that companies who get it, you know, my, my mom and dad worked at the same company for 30 years and their boss knew my name came to my graduation. I went, you know, had company picnics. I mean, it's just, it's so interesting. I just feel like in the past couple of years before the pandemic, we started, we stopped treating people as people and started t treating them as expendable. And so in return, people, mo a lot of people quit their jobs within nine months. Nobody stays anywhere anymore. We have a philosophy at Dr. Phil from day one called family first. I've always told people that are associated with the show, look, if there's that piano recital, if there's that Christmas program, if there's that baseball game, they may not make eye contact if you're there, but trust me, if your seat's empty, they'll see it for sure. We're not curing cancer here. <laughs> We're making television. You got maybe two kids you need to be there. We do 175 shows a year. We'll be fine. You know what? Once they got that that was for real, nobody took advantage of that. You know, I've heard people say, oh, my God, my people, well, they'd have something every day they had to go to. That never happened. Yeah. They all said, hey, thank you for that. And they did. They were there for their kids. And our people have been here 20 years. I've seen their kids born, go up now and go off to college and stuff. And it makes such a difference. That's why people stay instead of move around all the time. And we lost that. And I think the pandemic is an ability for us to reset that because I do think that that's what people want. You know, I think about myself, like I, I you know, when I had my first son, I barely saw him. And I, I, again, I had more miscarriages than I can count before I had my son. And, but I was on two planes, two trains, working so hard, blah, I mean, everything. The first time he took his steps, I saw it on video. His first words, I saw it on video. I missed everything. And I would look at myself and I said, well, that's the price that you have to pay because having it all is just a euphemism for doing it all, right? And when I had my second son during the pandemic, I got to do everything, every bath, every meal. I saw every step, every word. I was there. And after, I'm like, I am never going back to that. And I think a lot of parents, a lot of working parents, people work hard in this country. 
And I think a lot of working parents are like, no, 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 no. I want to see my kids. I want to be at that game. I want to be at that recital. I want to see their first words. I want to be there. Um, but I got to work too. And I want to work. And so how do we balance this? And I think that that is the, that, that's what we got to figure out right now. I try to get people to adopt this symbol system and recognize there are different types of currency. There's monetary currency. There's emotional currency. There's spiritual currency. There's familial currency. There's all kinds of currency. You can stack up monetary currency, but if you're bankrupt on your familial currency, then it's like grades. If you get an A and an F, that averages to a C. You're not doing well. You've got to recognize different kinds of currency. On your second one, you said, wow, you got a lot of familial currency there. You were there for those steps, for those words, for those baths, and you had to feel like you were rich with that currency. Very rich. Yeah. Very rich. But sometimes we don't recognize that currency is as valuable as the monetary currency. That's right. That's right. And I also think it's like, what's the point of the past two years? going through this pandemic, you know, seeing loved ones pass. What's the point if we're not going to learn something from it? And that's a great takeaway. You talk about these things and you say there are four key steps to creating lasting change. Empower working women, educate corporate leaders, revise our narratives about what it means to be successful, which we were just talking about a little bit, and advocate for policy reform. You talk a lot about that in this book, and I really want people to pick this up. Again, it's pay up the future of women in work and why it's different than you think. You take some really novel angles of approach to this. I think people are particularly women and hopefully leaders that want to keep their workforce motivated and together are going to really find this compelling. So I really advocate for people reading this book. I think they're going to love it. Look on her backlist as well, because she wrote Brave Not Perfect, which we talked about earlier. And this would be two great books for you to read. And if you've got daughters, you really want to read this. And if you're a manager and you want to keep your workforce (laughs) motivated, (laughs) and that chip on the shoulder is a good thing, right? It's worked for you. Will you run for office again? When they stop being so crazy over there, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. I mean, it's just, I feel like, I feel like God put me on this earth to be a warrior. And so I'm always looking for what's the best way that I can serve the people. And I've been serving them this way, outside of the system, helping mothers, helping girls. And, you know, right now, I just don't think you can make the same kind of change in Washington. But maybe one day when it changes, I may be ready. Well, I think everything you're doing would prepare you to do that, but you're certainly making a lot of noise outside the system. So I hope you keep doing what you're doing because it sure makes a lot of sense. And nobody can look at what you're saying and argue with the sense of it or the impact of it. That's why I started this out by saying, if they heard me saying, here's someone that's going to talk about coding, computer work, that that would be such a disservice if they went, oh, doesn't apply to me. That's why I was saying that, not to trivialize the importance of that, but just because you talk about so much more. And you've done it very well today. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk about all of this. Thank you so much for having me. Huge deal. Let's talk again. I would love that. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. You bet. So long.